Welcome to Barker's Random Projects. This is our automatic Halloween candy dispenser. Kids come up to the door, push a button, and out comes the candy. All we have to do is fill it up and plug it in. So how did we end up with this? Well, like many great inventions, this all started with a problem. We both wanted to go trick-or-treating with the kids on Halloween because they're freaking adorable. The problem is it seemed kind of wrong to take candy from everyone else without handing out any candy ourselves. There is the classic leaving a bowl on the porch idea, but after a couple of greedy kids come by, you're usually out of candy. So, like many people today, we turned to the internet to see if we could find a solution to our problem. And we did find a lot of different kinds of candy dispensers, but they all had a really similar design. They had some sort of narrow container at the top that would filter candy into some type of device you would rotate and get candy out of. The problem with these is that they all used unwrapped candies, which is a big no for Halloween. So, we decided we'd make our own candy dispenser. Whenever you're designing something, it's always a good idea to establish a criteria. Criteria are usually broken into two categories, things that it has to do and things that you would like it to do. We decided ours would have to automatically dispense wrapped candies without any jamming. Ideally, it would distribute the same amount of candy to each kid without crushing any of the candies in the process and allow us to do a variety of candies because we like a variety of candies and someone has to eat all the leftovers. Now it was time to brainstorm solutions, and we came up with three main ideas. And a quick disclaimer, I am not an artist. These are just some sketches I threw up on a whiteboard to help people get an idea of the concepts that we were talking about. Our first idea was really similar to the other things we had seen. You would load candy in from the top, it would funnel it down to the bottom, and there would be some kind of mechanism to open. This one has just a door. The problem is that wrapped candies usually have very different geometries, and you'd be likely to get a lot of jamming, or you would have an uncontrollable flow and when you tried to shut the door, you would either crush the candies or wouldn't be able to close it. Our second idea was to use a rotating door. One section would have an opening that the candy could flow into. Then, as you rotated it to the second position, it would pull that candy out with it while closing it off to prevent unwanted flow. This would really help with the portion controls. The biggest challenge with this design would be making sure we got the spacing right to prevent any type of jamming, as well as preventing crushed candies. Our third idea was to use a conveyor belt to pull candy out of the hopper, then use a sensor at the end to determine when the candy had come out. We used our previously established criteria to evaluate each of the designs and selected the conveyor belt design because we thought it would allow us to have a variety of candies with the least likelihood of jamming. We then ran out to our garage, grabbed a 2x4, shoved a couple of wooden dowels in it, cut up some PVC pipe we had laying around, and grabbed an exercise band from our basement. We use these parts to build a quick conveyor belt, and this can be fun for your kids if you want to move a couple of lightweight objects. We used it to test our idea out to see if it was feasible. Unfortunately though, we didn't notice the sagging going on with only a few candies on the belt. Despite years of experience and college degrees, we decided we'd skip the steps of research, calculations, and drawings, and go right into the build. We figured that it was a simple enough design and it would save us some time. Unfortunately, our optimism did not pay off. Our first design was pretty basic. It had a wooden frame, a couple wooden dowels with bearings for rollers, the same exercise band from earlier for our belts, and was powered by a stepper motor attached to the drive roller with a coupler. First we made sure that it was working, and then we added the candy. And at first there was a little bit of progress, although very slow, and then it stopped altogether. We ended up removing the hopper to see what was going on. Upon further examination, we realized that the weight of the candy was actually pushing the conveyor belt down. Then we examined our drive shaft and realized that it was actually wrapping the belt around it, and in some instances pulling the candy in with it. We made a couple of modifications. We added two more rollers to help add support to the belt, and we changed the belt to the highest resistance exercise band we had. Unfortunately, our second test went very similar to the first. That meant that both the belt and the drive shaft were not working, which are the main components of a conveyor belt system. So, it was time to go back to the drawing board and do some research this time. The first thing we looked at was the belts we were using. Exercise bands were not going to work. They just couldn't hold up the candy and the amount of weight that would be put on them. We needed something that was more sturdy, but we also wanted something that would create a lot of friction. The friction is what helps the drive shaft grab the belt. When evaluating friction, there are two main factors you need to look at. The first one is called the coefficient of friction. That's an interaction between two materials. A good example of the coefficient of friction is if you take a block and put it on a smooth surface and then push it down. It will easily slide. This is represented by a low coefficient of friction. If you were to take that same block and move it to a rougher material and then try to push it down, you would have a lot harder time. 
This difficulty would be represented by a high coefficient of friction. We would want something with a high coefficient of friction, and we determined to use a strip of rubber that we could then glue into the belt size we needed. The second factor that goes into friction is force. That's how much two objects are being pushed together. When we were using the exercise bands, we would have to stretch them out over the rollers, and as the band would try to pull itself back into its original shape, that would push a force onto the roller itself and help create our friction. You may have even noticed in our first design that we had moved one of the rollers up. This was an attempt to increase the amount of force on the roller and help prevent slipping. We would need a way to create more force on the belt since the new belt material would be less elastic. To do this, we added a tension pulley, or tensioner is what we would usually call it. Tension is a type of force. The tensioner would allow us to move one of the rollers up and down in order to increase or decrease the amount of force being applied between the belt and the drive roller. We also decided to modify our drive roller to be larger and added a couple of extra rollers in for added support. And if you're noticing the larger circles on our drawing, those just represent the bearings that would make it easier for the rollers to spin. With our drawings done, it was time to build our new design. We thought it'd be fun to try to build a wheel out of wood, and we started by using a hole saw to cut out two wheels and then glued them together on a wooden dowel. Our second design still used a wooden frame, but we decided to switch out our wooden dowel rollers for copper pipe rollers and increase the bearing size. With everything assembled, it was once again time to test. And you may notice though that instead of our stepper motor being attached, we had a drill. We were using a drill for testing because it was easier to put on and off than our stepper motor. We designed a motor mount and back plate that were held on by four bolts. A coupler attached the motor shaft to the conveyor. There was a lot of bolt tightening to do, but luckily we had some help from an expert. Getting back to how our testing went, we found that this went much better than our first renditions and looked a lot more promising. However, we were still having some minor problems. Our belt would occasionally bind, and we noticed that the belt was riding up so much on one side that it was rubbing off onto the frame. We determined that the wooden wheel was a likely cause in this problem, and we decided to cut it out. Literally. We replaced the wooden wheel with one we printed on our 3D printer and designed it so that we could attach it to a drive shaft made of metal instead of wood. We hoped this would help us hold a tighter cylindricity and help get rid of some of the wandering we had with our belt. You may be wondering what cylindricity is. Well, cylindricity relates to tolerances. You may have noticed that nothing is perfectly square, flat, or rounded. There's always a little bit of variation. A great example of this is if you were to take a piece of paper, draw lines on it, and then cut it into strips, and then try to reassemble the strips in a different order, you would notice you have gaps and that each strip was slightly different from the others. Now you may be thinking if we used a machine, we wouldn't have this problem and you would be right, sort of. The machine would probably make the strips exact enough that we wouldn't notice the differences with the naked eye, but if we were to magnify it, we'd probably still notice the same problem of the strips being slightly different from each other. That's because a machine can hold a higher tolerance. That means it can make something closer to the ideal and that's what tolerancing is all about. It tells us how close we need to be to the ideal in order for something to work. There are actually entire systems and books written about tolerancing and all the details, but we won't be getting into any of that. But that explains why we tried to switch from our wooden wheel to a plastic one in hopes of being able to hold a tighter tolerance. The same thing applied to earlier when we switched from using wooden rollers to metal ones. Unfortunately, even with the changes we made, we still saw slight wandering with our system. Remember that tensioner we talked about earlier? Well, we decided to move it to the end of the conveyor so it would be easier to make adjustments. Then, after talking to someone who's actually worked on conveyor belts, we learned that not only does the tensioner keep the belt tight, but it can actually be used to guide the belt. If you watch the part of the belt toward the bottom of the screen, you'll notice that as we adjust that side's tensioner, we're able to either bring the belt closer to the edge or further from it. By using this adjustment, we can make up for anything that might not be square or as cylindrical as we'd like. With the conveyor belt up and running, it was time to move on to our hopper. We actually found that a cereal box fit great and decided to use it, because it would be easy for us to make adjustments to the holes in it in order to allow the candy to flow more smoothly. We also decided to add an extra piece of cardboard in the bottom to help keep the candies flowing and create an angle so that we wouldn't have any jamming right there. Then we cut the hole in the top so we'd be able to load it from the top. Then after setting it on the conveyor belt, we realized we needed some way to keep it from touching the conveyor belt. To solve that problem, we decided to glue some strips of cardboard to the sides. This would be just slightly over the wooden frame part and it would hold the hopper up. We also added 
a strip of cardboard in the front because we didn't want it to be popping open on us. After all these adjustments were done, it was time to test out our candies. As we tested the hopper, it became very clear that although we had a large variety of candies to begin with, the M&Ms and Reese's Peanut Butter Cups were constantly causing jams, and by removing them, we no longer had that problem. Besides the hopper's geometry, we also used the movement of the conveyor belt to help prevent jamming. We wanted to use a stepper motor to drive the belt because it would give us the option to precisely control how fast or how slow the motor was going. We could have gone the traditional brushed motor route, but the stepper motor's accuracy is what gave us the ability to more easily add features, such as vibrating the belt to prevent clogs, shuffling the candy to help them lay flat on the belt, and to slowly move the belt forward. To appreciate the value of the stepper driver, we must know the basics of how the stepper motor works. In simple terms, there are four wires that come out of a stepper motor, which power is applied to in different sequences to rotate the motor shaft. The stepper driver simplifies that sequence for us. For example, we can tell the stepper driver to turn on, move a specific direction, and the speed it should move. The stepper driver then translates those instructions and turns on the four wires in the correct sequence to move the shaft of the motor. For the Arduino boards, I went to work getting the programming down, which is available on GitHub, linked in the description below. As you can see, we have two Arduino Uno boards meshed together on the candy dispenser. We initially used a proximity sensor to determine if the candy was dropped. We realized that the process of reading the proximity sensor took a long time, which delayed telling the stepper motor when to stop. To get around this, we wired two Arduino boards together. One of them drove the stepper motor, and the other one worked on getting data for everything else, such as listening for the button to be pushed, and reading the sensor. This solved the delay problem, but unfortunately we were not able to use the proximity sensor for other reasons. The readings for the proximity sensor were not accurate and wide enough to determine if a piece of candy dropped. Sometimes candy would sneak by on one side of the sensor or get really odd readings if the candy was angled a specific way because the sound waves would be going in different directions. The proximity sensor works like sonar. It sends a small blip of sound and then listens for that sound to bounce back. The time it takes for the sound wave to bounce off an object and the return is the key to determining how far away something is. That small amount of time is the original reason why we decided to use two Arduino boards. To solve our proximity sensor problem, my wife said a brake beam sensor would be superior in this application. The infrared brake beam sensor works by sending an infrared light from one end and receiving that light on the other. When that light is no longer seen, then there is something interrupting the beam. In this case, a piece of candy. While the beam is interrupted, the belt is told to move slightly, then wait about a quarter of a second. This sequence will repeat until the beam is no longer obstructed. This tells us that the candy was successfully dispensed. We used a huge 100cm classic arcade game button. We designed the case and printed it on our 3D printer. The button works by using a limit switch to determine if the button was pressed. Once pressed, the light turns off and ignores additional pushes until a candy is dispensed. This prevents multiple pushes from confusing the machine. Looking back, we may be able to get away with only having to use one Arduino board because the amount of time it takes to read the infrared brake sensor is much less than the amount of time it takes to read the proximity sensor. We decided to leave it in though, so we can use it to add extra features in the future, such as determining if the candy is out and sending me a text message telling me to come fill it back up. The final step was to build a cover for it. We just used cardboard and put a cartoon ghost on the front to keep it simple this year, but we'd love to do something amazing for next year. And we'd like you guys to help us choose the idea, so put your ideas in the comment section below or vote for someone else's. Thanks for watching, please like and subscribe so we can keep this stuff coming. Well, good thing I had some gloves on. <laughs>